Okay, we're back. We're live. We're at Think Tech Talks here on a given Wednesday at the 5 o'clock block. Um, you could see more about us on the, the Global. We call it the Think Tech Global. It's our program uh, advisory that comes out every morning. And if you want to be on that Global, just sign up on thinktechhawaii.com. Uh, today we're talking about computers uh, and computer budgeting at the uh, enterprise level. We have Michael Smith from Gartner with us, and uh, he's an analyst who deals with uh, exactly how corporations should behave themselves when they plan for the next generation of hardware and software, yeah? Exactly, and services. And services. Yeah. And, uh, and Dale Aiello, from, who is a local Gartner man, yes, sir. been here since 1912, uh, well, and yeah. been on the show many <laughs> times. <laughs> from Gartner also. So um, yeah, we're going to call this um, IT as the backbone of the business community. Because I think people in businesses and even, you know, even large jurisdictions forget that they have to attend to this, that it doesn't happen automatically, and that it, at no point is it static. At, and, and, and Gartner can tell us that. So you're here for a special uh, presentation, Michael. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us the reason for your trip and uh, what you've done so far? Yeah, um, most businesses uh, at the enterprise level struggle to determine the right level of funding for their IT organizations. Uh, in fact, ever since 2008, there's been a tremendous amount of pressure on CIOs and IT leaders to reduce their budgets. In fact, it's gotten so bad that it's beyond the point of uh, just difficult. They're actually underfunding uh, the IT budget. Why? Um, I think it's because they don't understand it. Uh, there are two aspects of a budget. There's the capital budget, the project spend. That they seem to, you know, fare reasonably well. Uh, and I believe that the reason executives understand the project spend is because they can ask questions. When are we going to start? When are we going to end? What's the change? How much? What's the benefit? What's the cost? Mm -hmm. And they can get comfortable around that decision, whether to fund it or not. But the operating part of the budget, this is keeping the lights running, they don't understand that at all. And the reason is the way we present that information to them. Uh, we present it in these categories that are very difficult. Uh, Who's we? The IT management teams. And there's a reason for this, too. Uh, the reason is that uh, the budgets, for operating part of the budget are set by the finance department. And we have what's called a chart of accounts, which is a, a set of <laughs> categories. That this is we, like corporate psychiatry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, but there are categories like people, hardware, software, telecommunications, services, and so forth. <coughs> it's gonna fit in the chart. Exactly. Right? <laughs> and it does, it's very nice, and it, and it fits its purpose that you can track expenses very important part of a budget that you can track expenses. The problem with it is you can't defend it. You know, how would you defend, say, a $100 million hardware budget in 15 words or less to a CEO or CFO? It's very hard to make that analysis. You know, I mean, the thing is, uh, what, what I'm thinking is this. Whenever you put a new system in or even make a substantial upgrade on an old system, mm -hmm. you're changing the way the cor corporation does business. Mm -hmm. You know, I used to think that it's the other way around, um, that the, the way the corporation has done business changes, and therefore you have to catch up with it. And that may be so, so true in the short term. Yeah. But in the long term, what you put in new changes the way the company behaves profoundly. Absolutely. It makes another company out of it. Absolutely. Everything has to change. Absolutely. And how do you put a price on that? You have to explain to this manager that when you do this, your company is going to be much more profitable, much more efficient, right. and he's going to say, show me. Yeah. And it's very hard to do, do that, it especially is. if you're dealing with a generation of managers that's, that's one generation behind. Right, exactly. And IT sales people are no, notoriously good communicators. So yeah. you don't have IT people with the ability to sell their vision or their their yeah. budget request. Yeah. And uh, as Gardner says, IT people are second only to four strangers in communicative <laughs> skills. So. But there are actually some companies that have cracked the code here. How? They actually redefine these categories. They keep the chart the, of accounts. Well, they, they don't go there because they don't want to make the CFO <laughs> mad. Mistake. Yeah, yeah don't, don't make the CFO <laughs> mad. But they, uh, they create a services view of that same money. 
So they take all that hardware and software and telecommunications and they create a list of services like provisioning, workplace support, automated financial reporting, things that you can understand and talk about the same way you could with the project spend, and they then explain the budget that way. And it's working fantastically. So, okay, so that's a change in the whole model of corporate mm. thinking there. Mm, mm. Uh, you have to train people to buy into that. Right. Uh, you have to take that earlier generation and sort of update the generation first before you can update the computer system. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and that's not so easy. I mean, I'm thinking this is an interesting parallel. You know uh, the story of Sonny Bagualia mm -hmm. yeah. uh, here in Hawaii. Well. You know, we found that we, I don't know, maybe you guys are involved in this. We are. You we are. are. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, this was a guy that uh, Neil Abercrombie hired to, you know, take a look at the computer system for the state of Hawaii, which was notoriously outdated. behind, outdated, you know, outdated. And uh, he spent, I don't know, like three, four years um, looking at it and said, "This is badly outdated." That's what he said, and and then he left. <laughs> well, he had the vi he was a visionary, so he was yeah. kind of the upfront sales guy to get the legislature, the Senate, everybody on board. We never had a state Seattle prior to Sonny coming yeah, on. Yeah. And so it takes somebody to get the ball rolling down the hills, raise the money. Um, you know, and, and Sonny was a very qualified Seattle. He'd done it many times in the federal government. GSA. Yeah. GSA and several other that he worked for. And so now he was under a three-year contract when that, when that vision was completed. And then, which is common in IT, there's operations guys that come in and you know, you have an architect designs the house, and then you have the, the construction guys come in, put in the plumbing, electrical, and so. Now the CIO is uh, the operational CIO, and he's um, he is charged with implementing Sonny's vision now, which is Sonny painted a very big vision to encompass the whole state, centralizing IT, which has been decentralized for 40 years, mm -hmm. and very vastly under budgeted, and culturally very, you know, like you said. If they put half of these systems in that he talked about, it's going to change the culture of the entire state government. Right, which so probably means a loss of jobs, which I means you, you know you get a sort of negative reaction. The unions will people. never let it, there be a loss yeah. of jobs, but reskilling of jobs is how they you want have to. You have to sell it that way. Yeah. But what's interesting is that you have a legislature which is controlling the purse. It's not really one, you know, budget or finance Ooh, guy. Yeah. It's the legislator, legislature, yep. and somebody is asking them to put in lots of money. Uh, and they don't, I, in my view, in my view, they don't see the picture that you're painting. Right. They don't see that there's going to be additional services necessarily. Uh, they look at it as, is this going to give us a Band-Aid? You know, this is the wrong yeah. way to look at it, but oh, yeah. is this going to give us a Band-Aid that yeah. will fix what ails it? Right. Uh, and the answer is, let's, let's reel this back and show you what it means mm -hmm. to really get updated in, in the whole state enterprise. Mm -hmm. It's just like big corporations, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Well, you have I have to convince them first. But I think it's more difficult in the public sector. The one thing about the private sector, there's always that uh, way to measure success, profits. And, you know, cash flow is key. Um, in the public sector, there's a diverse set of objectives. You know, it depends on the, the department or agency. You can have things as diverse as, like, health and human services versus police and safety. I mean, they're very different things. And trying to achieve those, and then to make it even worse, is you've got new uh, leadership every four years. So, you know, if you've got a five year project, <laughs> that could be a problem. Um, so, a lot of, you know, it takes a year for the new administration to come in, get their settled uh, in, in position. They get then one or two years at most to rate, make any meaningful change. And then and they got to get, yeah. And they're gone. Right. And then somebody else comes in. You have to retrain them from the very beginning. Right. This is the same problem that exists. I mean, it's not a parallel. It's part of the same package. This is <coughs> the same problem that exists for tech in general in this right. state. No. Beyond the computer system, it's building a tech industry, mm -hmm. you know, building the jobs, uh, incentivizing the companies, mm -hmm. um, exporting intellectual property, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So um, you guys are part of uh, an important, a critically important um, path yeah. for the state, yeah. uh, inside and outside. Um, and I don't, you know, I really, I mean, I'm happy that you're on the show because I, I want to say that. I'd like to know your thoughts about how you change the way a, a large enterprise works mm -hmm. so that they see the picture and realize how it affects the future. 
the, it's really the techniques, you know, uh, agile, new man uh, project management techniques, new development techniques that are all designed to be more flexible and for you to be able to implement things in a shorter period of time. Uh, and, and, and this is being adapted not only in the pu uh, public sector, but in the private sector as well. Uh, because gone are the days where we could implement, take three years to implement an ERP system. You know, if you think about it, the whole business has changed in 12 months. Look at the difference between the, the corporate environment in 2008 and 2009. I mean, you begin to implement something in 2008 that takes three years, you basically have to start all over again. And then corporations at risk. Right. Because, you, because it didn't work within that period. Right. So things like stage gating and other techniques that you can use to uh, put projects in in segments. And then uh, once you get to the, to the stage gate, then adjust and move to the second stage. Um, they're not the cheapest way to go. Okay. The Big Bang, you know, all at once on paper is the cheapest. But they're also the highest risk. So you do uh, spend a little bit more money to implement some of these uh, techniques that are more flexible, but you lower the risk. Stage gating is where you, you take the stage, you look, you evaluate what you've done, right. you decide about some of the details for the next stage, exactly. and you go on down that way. Right. So you it's fund, a trial and error kind of thing. Yes, you fund to a certain point. You don't fund the whole project. Yeah. You fund, say, uh, three months. Yeah. And then you have a deliberate place where yeah. you can go or no go. Yeah. And then you can fund to another sp a specific place, adding value at each point, but not completing the project. Well, you know, that raises an interesting question. I mean, I'm, my background is from a small law firm. Mm -hmm. And, the, you know, and some of our partners uh, were Luddites, may I say. Nice, nice guys. But, um, and they would say, if, if this computer adventure isn't going to earn us more money right now, today, yeah. immediately after we write the check for the new equipment, we don't want it. Right. And, if it and, the, and they, in fact, they would say, if it still works, don't fix it. Yeah. I mean, we keep it as long as we possibly can until it falls apart, right. you know, and the, and, the, and the pieces pop out. Right. That's when we keep it. <clears throat> yeah. And so, you know, and the other side of that argument, which I'm sure is relevant at every level, is you have to have an ongoing plan. This isn't a matter of going out and buying new computers for everybody in the office, putting a new network in. It's a matter of looking at that all the time, sort of like stage gating, I think. Exactly. Yeah. And so you're, you're, you're involved in a perpetual upgrade. Right, exactly. So is, are we talking, is stage gating a perpetual upgrade, or is, the, is it an upgrade of a specific project which starts on day one and ends like a year later? Uh, or is it all the same? No, stage gating uh, applies specifically to, to new initiatives. Uh, what you were referring to about um, knowing when to uh, update or uh, renew uh, has to do with life cycle management. And what's really happening with IT is we're growing up. You know, these concepts of life cycle management have been around since the pyramids. Um, you know, trucking companies learned that a diesel uh, truck needs to be retired at a million miles because even though the truck may be running, the cost of running that thing is going to go way up. So uh, at a million miles, give or take, let's retire and get a new truck. Um, we've got to adapt that understanding to some of the IT assets we use. We, we should realize going in that a particular asset may have a three-year useful life or three or four years, mobile devices or even less. And when they reach that point, the least cost of ownership is to retire the asset and replace it. Um, it doesn't, it sounds counterintuitive, but in the long run, if you've got a long-term sustained need for mobile uh, capability, uh, retire the assets at the end of their useful life. Sometimes you're going to say, well, we are expanding our business into this area. Mm -hmm. We're going to need more mobile, wireless, what have you. Yeah. We don't have it now, yeah. but, we've, but our corporate plan goes there. Yeah. And it, this goes hand in hand with our corporate plan. Right. And so we have to make the two touch. Yeah. They have to run in parallel. Yeah. That means you have a lot of people to convince. Yeah. And we're going to take a break now, Michael. But okay. when we come back, I'd like to ask you how to convince them. Okay. What do you say? <laughs> What's the pitch? <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's Michael Smith. Uh, he's with Gardner, and he comes from where? Uh, North Carolina. North Carolina, 
-hmm. uh, and he's a, 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 an, an analyst for Gartner, and he's here to, on a speaking mission to educate us about how to do corporate, uh, rather enterprise uh, planning and financial planning for upgrades in uh, computer equipment. This is Think Tech Talks. We have Dale Aiello. He's the Hawaii manager for Gartner, and um, he always has a place at this table. Thank you. <laughs> we'll be right back. <laughs> Aloha, I'm Hunter Hevelin, host of Sustainable Hawaii here at Think Tech Hawaii. You can tune in every week on Thursday at 2 p.m. to see interviews with sustainability professionals from around the state and even further abroad, learning about activities with water management, food security, waste management, and a whole host of other uh, fascinating opportunities to get engaged with making a greener island. So if you're interested in making the transition from consuming individuals to communities of producers, Check us out every Thursday. Okay, we're back. We're live. We're here with Michael Smith and Dale Aiello of Gartner. And uh, we're talking about, um, about uh, enterprise IT. And uh, uh, IT as a, is the backbone of the business community. Indeed, it is. And we know that. You know, we saw Sony recently. Mm. We, and we began to realize, I think all of us, is that this country is living on computers. Mm -hmm. Everything we do in every way, every aspect of our lives, try to wake up one morning and not have all the computers around us and see what happens. Right. Mm -hmm. exactly. you know, so we've got to stay current on that. Mm -hmm. A great nation deserves a great IT. There you go. Hey, <laughs> that sounds good. Coach, I know. <laughs> well, there's lots of opportunities, but there's also lots of threats. Yeah. And that's why IT management is a very important discipline in an enterprise, uh, both on the upside and mitigating the downside. So, uh, but I think you had a question about... I did. My question was, how, how do you... You come in, you're a Gartner or you're a, you know, a, a sort of a bright-eyed, uh, adventurous uh, young executive in a company that may be a little slow to pick up the ball on this, mm -hmm. and your mission is to change the way they think about it yep. and to pitch, uh, you know, the new system and the staging and, you yeah. know, move forward. So yeah. how do you, and, and then the guy you're talking to, is the guy who wants to see justification for every penny. Yep. Be very careful, and he doesn't see it the same way. Yeah. How do you change his way of thinking? Yeah. Well, first of all, justifying IT investments is not a bad thing. Oh, in, sure. in fact, uh, the success rate of IT projects goes up the more thorough the planning phase of the project is. That's everything that happens before you get approval. Sometimes uh, people like to race through that you know, the just do it, you know, approach. We'll figure it out once we get started. That's a recipe for disaster. So the more you can spend, and, and a lot of that has to do with justification, building the business case, quantifying the benefits. Sounds like a lot of minutia and tough stuff, especially to technologists, but it actually turns out to set them up for success. So it's time well spent. I like to say it's the discovery phase of the project. And rather, rather than do discovery, during project execution, implementation, do the discovery before you start. And then hand them a plan. And hand them a plan that you can execute against. Okay. So, so with that in mind, there are things you can do, and it, it involves you know, education. So if you take someone like an executive, business executive, maybe an entrepreneur, or an owner of a business, small business, who's you know, got a lot of pressure on them, they've got to you know, uh, meet payroll, manage cash flow, and they, all of a sudden they stumble upon this investment they got to make now in IT. You know, why do I need to do this? Educate them about things like the total cost of ownership. Common mistake that a lot of business executives make is that they look at the acquisition price of a, of a technology as the total cost. Huge mistake. On average, in the, in the enterprise environment, the acquisition cost is about 20% of the total cost of ownership. So take whatever that laptop or iPad or you know whatever costs to buy, and multiply it times five, and that's what it's going to cost you over the next over the useful life of that asset. And the eighty percent is going to be what labor and expertise. It's going to be maintenance. It's going to be it's going cabling. to be securing it so you don't have things like the Sony uh, Pictures uh, debacle. Mm -hmm. uh, integrating it, um, you know, into the uh, Full, all the resources that are there, available in the enterprise environment, maybe uh, enterprise applications, email, calendaring, uh, other collaborative uh, resources. So 
providing all that and the support, because people, you know, run into problems. They forget their passwords. Uh, right. They have technical Every difficulties. Yeah. Right. So providing all of that, when, you, when they understand the true total cost of ownership, then they set expectations mm -hmm. properly. So not only does that set up a success for the initial implementation, but then when the IT manager has to go back a year later to get budget to, to continue the maintenance, the uh, executive remembers, oh, yeah, I, I do remember you talking about all that. Yeah, otherwise it's a swamp where it costs more than the expectation every day. Right. And the fellow who is proposing that is losing, losing credibility. Exactly. And, and we see that a lot. Oftentimes with new initiatives, uh, people only ask for funding for the implementation not the post-implementation support. And again, another rule of thumb is that the post-implementation costs equal about 20%, similar to the, to the acquisition costs, but about 20% of the implementation costs. So if you have a project that's gonna cost you a million dollars to implement, figure that the annual post-implementation costs are gonna be about uh, $200,000. So over a five-year period, the total cost of ownership for that idea is roughly 50% in implementation, 50% in post-implementation operating expense. So using these, when you go in to get funding, laying it all out, having that serious discussion, setting expectations properly is really uh, the best way to go. You said initiative, and we, we touched on that distinction mm -hmm. before, but uh, how long is an initiative these days, you know? I mean, it, mm. it w I would just take a wild guess and say that an initiative now is a shorter stroke than an initiative was, say, 20 years ago. Oh, yeah. And yeah. was it a year, two, three? How, how long is it? And does well, it depend on the business? Does it depend on the size of the enterprise? How do you fix that? Well, two ways of gauging the size of an initiative is one is cost, the other time. Uh, we advise against any initiative taking more than 12 months. Really, that fast? Yeah, and, and again, it gets back to uh, breaking a big project up. If it's going to take five years, break it up into three chunks and get value at each chunk. Again, not the cheapest way to do it, but the risks associated with multi-year projects are just through the roof Because now. you make a mistake at the beginning or, or you don't anticipate how the market or the technology is going or, to change. Actually, a better way would be to say, can anyone today honestly say that they know what their business is going to look like a year from now? That too. Yeah. I mean, realistically, it's impossible. So whatever assumptions you made about that solution um, are going to change within 12 months. Now, are these, you know, I'm, I'm getting the feeling that you're talking about enterprises that are large. I yeah. Mean, government, uh, major yeah. corporations and all, the, which we don't have that many actually in, in Honolulu mm -hmm. in a mm -hmm. way. Yeah. Um, but I'm wondering where Gartner, fi oh, well, first I'm wondering, whether the rules that you are articulating today yeah, apply yeah. only to the big companies or whether we guys in the small companies yeah. can benefit by the yeah. same analysis. Yeah. Well, we actually segment our market, the market gardener, into small to mid-sized enterprises. Less than $250 million in annual revenue would be a small to mid-sized enterprise. Yeah, and think then, tech would be in that category. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and non-profit in the fullest sense. <laughs> okay. And, uh, <laughs> So, but yeah, many of these rules do apply. Um, it's actually, there are huge economies of scale with information technology. Uh, one of the things we maintain is the largest database of enterprise spending statistics in the world. And when we look at that data across all industries, uh, companies that uh, spend more than 10 billion or have revenues of more than 10 billion versus the small companies, less than 250 million, the big companies actually spend 50% less on IT as a percent of revenue than do the small companies. it's more effective. It's the economies of scale. Yeah. That come from things like uh, leveraging security investment, uh, securing your environment, uh, contract negotiation, data integration, and life cycle management. Now let me throw this yeah. at you, Michael. Mm -hmm. You know, in the, in the legal business, uh, first, in, say, in the 70s, the 60s, the 70s, mm -hmm. Uh, all the big firms uh, here, anyway, uh, had big systems, or the biggest systems they could find. Mm -hmm. uh, and the little firms couldn't afford those things, so they had little, little things, little, yeah. little systems. Yeah. And the big firms definitely had an advantage on them in many, many ways. Yeah. And they would spend millions. Yeah. Okay, time goes by, and now you see the technology changes.
The computers get faster, the networks get easier to operate, yep. uh, the software is better, cheaper, what have you. Yes. Now the little firms, you know, have a position that's not so yeah. not so behind the, right. the curve, and they right. now can compete with the bigger firms, right. who are you know kind of you know having trouble with the larger enterprise approach right. to it because yeah. it, it's not they're not as nimble, and maybe right. that's a planning point. Yeah. But the little guys now all of a sudden have an advantage that they yes. haven't had before. Yes. So is it inherent in that? Yeah. Could it be? Mm -hmm. Could it be okay. <clears throat> that we have a situation here where yes. Uh, there is an enormous benefit of economies of scale. Right. And, and in the world, as it's in the global markets, the guy with the biggest computer system, the most sophisticated, well-designed computer system, he's going to be yeah. way ahead yeah. and do much more on a global basis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But is it, is it also that the smaller guys yes. who take advantage of cutting edge yes. and who get advice from people who yes. are really expert yeah. in larger questions can still catch up? Oh, absolutely. In fact, cloud is changing those economies of scale because what cloud does is it is provided by these huge uh, solution providers that have got the scale now whether or not they share all the, the benefits in terms of lower uh, cost to the small to mid-side en enterprise is a negotiating uh, issue but the cost to provide cloud solutions is much lower than what it would cost the small to mid-sized enterprise to obtain that capability on their own. So no longer, we would not recommend any small to mid-sized enterprise going out and, and investing, say, in their own data center, for example. Um, you know, buy that, rent that stuff, um, get those economies of scale. Now, again, you're not going to get all those economies because the people who have made those investments want to make money. But uh, you can negotiate much, much less expensive uh, pricing for really what these big infrastructure environments have. It's a whole um, thing about outsourcing. You can outsource parts right. of, of your initiative yeah. and therefore have um, you know, created a relatively even playing field with much yeah. larger companies. Yeah. That's where the role of the CIO has changed a lot now, where the CIO is not really a technology executive. He's more managing vendors. That's yeah. uh, vendor management because you've outsourced so many things now yeah. that uh, you really you just have to know how to manage and negotiate contracts yeah. with vendors. Yeah. So yeah. the CIO used to be a technology literate person. Now is coming up through the business ranks. They could be a sales guy. They might be a finance guy or business unit guy. So it's a t the environment's totally changed. So what training do I need to be a CIO in this new world? You're a good negotiator, world. probably. You probably would fit that bill. You, <laughs> you probably can qualify right now. Yeah, yeah. I actually wrote a, uh, a piece uh, on uh, the, the, the two primary skills to be a CIO in the year 2020. Okay. And just as Dale said, it was sourcing and product management. And the reason for product management, not project, but product, meaning being able to define what IT does in a way that the consumer can understand it, uh, is such an important skill is that getting back to those services in order to justify funding as a CIO you have to be able to explain to business executives what are we doing with that money and so you need a little product management in there a little marketing uh, to properly explain it um, and uh, so those are two very important skills you also have to have aside from the big picture and the way this is all integrated into your corporation you have to, and, and salesmanship, but also, I mean, negotiating skills, yep. but also the ability, correct me if I'm wrong, to evaluate whether a given vendor is going to come through or, or sink your ship. Right. No faster way to lose your job, no, than pick a bad one and have Absolutely. him damage the company. Yeah. And that's kind of what Gardner does. That's why we're in business. We objectively evaluate vendors, products, and services. Well, you know, the funny thing is I think I, we must be connected at the frontal lobe. Yeah. That was my next question. Tell us what Gartner yeah. does. Tell us why you're here and what benefit you provide and what your, you know, your role is in all of this. Let me go real fast and I'm going to turn it over to Dale. But I liken what Gartner does. We do not come in uh, and do the work for our clients. We, I'm an analyst, I'll come in doing research on a topic, we'll share that with the company. They, in a sense, it's teaching the man to fish. They have to do it themselves. I'll do you a real dumbed down example. 
Scottsdale may get mad at me, but we're sort of the Home Depot of uh, home improvement. Okay, <laughs> we're not the contractor who's going to come in and rip out all the walls and do all the spackling and painting, and so when you come back, ah, all done. That's not who we are. We're going to give you the instructions, the list of materials, and you've got to do it yourself. Our view is that's a better way, because when you're done, you know what you have. You can live in the house you built. And you understand that you spent the right. time, invested the right. thought process to know what you're doing. Yeah. But suppose I say to you, Michael, look, you know, this is way over my corporate head. Right. And you guys are so expert at this. You go yeah. all around the world. You, yeah. you know, you help the biggest entities that are imaginable on the planet. Right. Can you just handle it for me? Just come in and handle it. And let me know when you're done. Well, Dale can tell you that we actually do have a division. Well, we have a consulting practice that does kind of front end stuff, design stuff, planning, architecture. But you come into the corporation. Yeah. But then when it comes to actually doing the implementation, our whole core business is based on objectivity. So if we're telling you to do something that we come in and do for you, that's not really objective. We're trying to sell downstream mm. work, so to speak. So we, but we'll tell you based on our, we have 80,000 clients worldwide that are telling us this vendor is good at this, this vendor is good at that, which was your original comment. How do I know what vendors are qualified or which products are the best products? So we have a thousand analysts like Michael that are in various spectrums of IT. That's their job, evaluating vendors, products, services, and pricing, you... contracts, negotiating, things like that. So we may not do, but we can tell you, say, maybe here's three vendors that might be a good fit for this type of project, your size, our geographic location in Hawaii, uh, and just save you a lot of time and money. And we've already vetted these vendors. We've already checked their references. We've already checked their financial background. So if, if we say, and we might not say vendor X is better, but say here's three vendors, X, Y, and Z, you can talk to all of them, and depending on what criteria you think is most important to you, maybe to you cost is most important. So in that case, vendor Z may be best. Maybe cost isn't as uh, effective, but you need more widespread strategic uh, initiatives or more modules order. Maybe that case, vendor X is better. So we give you the pros and cons of vendors, products, and services, and kind of let you evaluate based on what your That's company is That's a huge requires. value yeah. to a company that may or may not know that within their own resources. And, then they, and when Gardner started in 79, I think we used to target the Fortune 500 companies because they were the only ones investing in technology. Yeah. Then we went to Fortune 1000, we went to Fortune 2000, and they're saying, well, how can you, how can I personally do business in Hawaii? We don't have any of those kinds of companies here. But technology has spread ubiquitously through every size of organization. And I've had, I had a company here as a client that had one IT guy. I've had, we have several companies that have three or four IT guys. Because they're trying to compete with the big guys, but they don't have the resources or the manpower. But they need the expertise to be, they don't have time to evaluate products, sit through demos. But they still need to to know who to use in, in yeah. certain situations. It's all mission critical, so, yeah. you know, what price yeah. uh, saving saving yeah. a company's so size, bacon? Size has really, technology's leveled the playing field when it comes to the size yeah. of companies. In some ways, though, Michael, we were talking to a banking client that there is leverage in size, which is why all the banks are mergers, mergers and acquisitions, and a lot of the big companies are so many mergers and acquisitions because there is economy of scale in, in yeah. especially in and industries like banking. I'll mm -hmm. take a wild guess and say that when two large organizations are merging or there's an acquisition um, where you know there were two systems before, mm -hmm. now there's going to be one system. Comcast, for example, would be an example of that happening yeah. here probably in the next few months, by my information. Uh, or in the case of <clears throat> Energy Next Era yeah. coming up soon, That'd be a good place for you guys to be, wouldn't it? Oh, they decided to use us to evaluate what the best migration path would be, what uh, <coughs> what what company system they're going to use. You know, we've had benefits here. For example, United and Continental merged, and that left uh, one system CIO out. So Ron Lehman, who's the CIO for Hawaiian Air, is now here because of, of that type of mm -hmm. merger and acquisition. So. Uh, it, it, it's a question of selecting the system and then figuring out what the best integration method is to, yeah. to utilize it. And, and generally, they'll select one CIO to, from one of the merged companies to run it. Well, speaking of migration, we're going to migrate into a break now. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, that's Dale Aiello, a Hawaiian manager for uh, Gartner, and Michael Smith, who's here on a speaking tour, is it fair to say? 
um, uh, and he's an analyst, and uh, we are talking today about uh, IT uh, as the backbone of the business community. If you didn't know it, that's what's happening here on Think Tech Talks. We'll be right back after this short break. Hi, I'm your host on Think Tech Asia, Bill Sharp. I look forward to, to you joining us each Monday between 4 and 5 o'clock uh, when we film right here in our studio in downtown Honolulu. The show, Think Tech Asia, focuses on contemporary events in Asia. And by Asia, we mean anything from Hawaii, south to Australia and New Zealand, well, west to Pakistan, and as far north as the Russian Far East. Clearly, this is one of the most economically dynamic centers of the world. Uh, and we bring you up to date on what's going on in a whole host of countries in this very vital region. We look forward to seeing you. Aloha. Okay, we're back with uh, Michael Smith and Dale Aiello of uh, Gartner. Um, Michael is here in town to, uh, to talk about uh, uh, IT as the backbone of the business community and um, making analysis so you know exactly what you're doing. Uh, in a world which is governed more and more every day by t technology. Uh, so I, I, I wanted to spend a minute and ask you about the traps. Mm -hmm. um, you know, where, where are the traps for companies these days? We, we know from Sony that, you know, uh, you always have a risk. And mm -hmm. these days there are people out there who um, are willing to try to shoot down the big boys for sure. Yeah. Uh, governments, but also hackers out of uh, Vladivostok. I would just like to do it for sport. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, th this is something that you can't necessarily build into your, your plan, or can you? Can you prevent that? Well, there's a pattern. Um, you know, these technology introductions kind of tend to come in waves. You know, we go about every 10 years, we get this sort of macro wave of new technology. And we're in the beginning of the digital age now. Uh, a lot of companies, enterprises, are talking about digital business, where companies are moving away from traditional media to communicate with prospects and customers and using social media now. No longer print or advertising, but they're using social media. Um, well, along with this change comes a lot of unintended consequences uh, because as we automate more, we become more dependent on and exposed to the fundamental information that's being carried through that technology. So uh, we have this hype cycle, we call it, where early on in the technology wave, there are these inflated expectations. Oh, the world is going to be great. This is going to solve world hunger. We're going to be wonderful. And then they implement it, and then all of a sudden, the trough of disillusionment. You get those issues you talked about, like Sony. Or another one, not just security, but data quality. You mentioned mergers and acquisitions. Think of two banks, right? They merge. They think, oh, gosh, we're going to be able to support all these customers. Now they have two different databases where they identify the customers with two different uh, uh, customer IDs. They may be sending information to one uh, from the other system and overlapping. Ask yourself this, how many of you are in the second year of your uh, contract with a cable TV provider and you open your mail, either electronic mail or regular mail, to see an offer uh, to subscribe to the exact same service that you have for 20% of the cost, you're paying for it. How do they know? Well, the question is, how come they don't know? Why don't <laughs> they know that you're their customer? And they just spent money to make you angry at them. You bet. Right? So, so data integration, data quality, uh, you know, uh, managing th this information, those are things that can really come up and bite you. So um, I would be very ticked if that happened. <laughs> it happens all the time. You see uh, Hawaiian Telecom and Oceanic sending out promotions every month. They're competing month, with themselves. Uh, compete, right. Well, in most cases, they don't know that you're a client of one or the other of themselves. <laughs> right. You're paying 100 a month, and they say, oh, we're, put, we're offering Internet access for $30 a month. And you go, well, why am I paying 100 I don't understand. But that. from a programming point of view, it's easy not to do that. Right. It's easy right. to program out of that right. easily. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, but it's, it's the, really fundamentally, it's information security, yeah. it's uh, data quality, yeah. uh, information integration, and the interesting thing is that many of the people who are at the tip making these decisions are not aware of that, you know, that, and that's why we need our IT management teams, uh, because they understand how data quality doesn't come with uh, a purchase order, okay? Data quality has to be engineered. Um, and there are, there's a discipline around that. 
a master data management and other techniques that have been learned over many years by IT professionals. So the, the heads of marketing, the heads of product development that are experimenting with all of this new technology now really need to involve their IT departments in those decisions. You know, I can imagine, just to sort of give people the idea, the, the, the depth and breadth of this, we have corporations that have hundreds of millions of records. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the format is different from this to that or from one company to another in a mm -hmm. merger acquisition. And somebody with a little green visor has to sit in a basement somewhere and make them work yeah. and change the fields and change the way the information yeah. is stored in the fields and do this for hundreds of millions. Right. It strikes me there must be huge software oh. in the back office yeah. to deal with all that data. And we never see it. Yeah. There are techniques where you can, using master data management techniques, they actually go into two separate databases and discover redundant customer information or missing customer information. Uh, there are tools that you can use post-merger to help clean up uh, your consolidated databases. So there's a lot of things to do, but, um, but it takes planning uh, and management. Well, suppose you lurch forward. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you don't make a plan. Mm -hmm. You don't have initiatives. Right. You just, you react. Right. You know, it's like uh, emergency management. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and you don't use Gartner either. Yeah. And, I mean, it sounds to me like terrible things not only can happen to yeah. you, but will happen to you. Yeah. I'm sure you have some horror stories. Well, just think of this statistic. The um, success rate of, we don't like to call them IT projects, the bad connotation. We use the word initiative. IT-enabled business initiatives. So uh, automating something. Um, the success rate of all IT-enabled business initiatives is 60%, meaning 60% of what the sponsor of that project, the executive thought they were going to get uh, when they funded it, is actually realized. So the 40%, what happens? The things that you, the unintended consequences. It's this, people do not plan. They rush into implementation. Someone will get an idea, we got to do this, and uh, funding is obtained, and off they go. And they try to figure it out as they go. And that's where those unintended consequences, the gotchas, you know, the data integration problems that weren't considered, the data security issues surface, the incompatibility of uh, technologies uh, becomes obvious, and, uh, and even behavioral change. Like all of a sudden, the people who have to use these new systems, some of them realize that their work just doubled. You know, they had no idea that was going to happen. Mm -hmm. So it's all of that which really comes from poor planning. The analogy I like to use is, let's say, and you've got a lot of skyscrapers going up here in uh, Honolulu. I don't know who's building all these buildings. <laughs> but let's just say that somebody got the idea to build a new building, 40-foot uh, high-rise. And rather than plan it, they just said, I'll tell you what. You guys with the cement trucks, on Monday, you show up. <laughs> and we'll work it out. Too. And we'll figure it out as we go. <laughs> what kind of a building would that, that doesn't, be? It doesn't work. No. <laughs> no. And in well, Hawaii, with the small IT shops, it's harder to plan because you don't have time. You're busy firefighting all the time. One of our sure. analysts says, well, you know, our smaller clients, are, a lot of our clients are firefighting by day, yeah. putting out the fires that were arsonists by night. Yeah. You know, so we're creating our own problems, and then the next day we have to fix them. You yeah. know, so. Well, the one thing, the one thing I, I get is sort of a subtext here is that if, if you're somebody like Gartner and you see this on a global basis and you have, you know, um, a community of people you trust in terms of uh, rec re recommending vendors and all that, mm -hmm. uh, and you're looking really at every possibility in the world in terms of corporate entities and government entities, you know a lot. And so that suggests that, A, you can find lessons in there yeah. to be globally relevant. Yeah. B, it also suggests that there is probably a consolidation going on in this industry uh, where the big guys get bigger because they have the leverage, you know, the, mm -hmm. the economies of scale mm -hmm. of that leverage. So my final question for you guys is, what do you think is going to happen here? Um, I mean, Gartner is a successful company. Mm -hmm. That's obvious. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to get much bigger. Uh, how about its competition? Um, how about the systems that you are working with mm -hmm. and designing? Are you going to be able to create systems that are slicker still, mm 
-hmm. where I put in, say, the critical data for a corporation, mm -hmm. fill in a form, if you will, mm -hmm. and I get a presumptive initiative right, right out, spits it right out mm -hmm. at me. Um, is this in the, in, in the wings? Mm -hmm. Where are we going here in the next five years? Well, from my perspective, what, I think the question is, where's technology going? True. And, and that is, um, it's becoming information enabled. It used to be that toasters and refrigerators, you know, were electronic devices that you would never think of having the capability to actually sense and communicate information. They all do. Automobiles, everything, apparel. The Internet of Things. The Internet of Things. And so as that happens, basically information management becomes part of everybody's job. That's the scary part to me. Because there, are, in IT, when it used to be obvious, back in your father's IT, when a piece of hardware and software you knew, oh, that's got to be implemented by IT, the people understood those uh, IT management issues. Now uh, people are making investments in the Internet of Things, digital marketing. They don't understand the fundamental uh, risks associated. And to me, uh, it's going to happen, though. We're going to work our way through it. We're going to have these horror stories that are going to come up. We're going to work through them. We're going to learn. We're going to get better. And it's going to continue. Hope so. Because yeah. you always have that kind of lag where the technology gets more complex, but people are not following it as fast as, as its complexity is growing. Yes. And then you get that kind of right. elastic problem there somewhere. Yeah. Well, Dale, why don't you close? What, what have we learned from this conversation with Michael Smith? What did we learn today? Well, we learned Michael's a very smart guy. I think, <laughs> okay. and, uh, uh, I think technology in Hawaii is... Uh, moving along at the pace of everybody else on the mainland. When analysts come out, I always ask them, what's your impression of why? And they're not saying we're in the dark ages. I talk to them about our state government. They go, Hawaii state government's no worse than any other government we deal with. So yeah. I think we're, you know, technology has one way of leveling the playing field of keeping us all moving along. You've got an iPhone or an Android or some latest model phone in your pocket, just like somebody in Manhattan or Chicago or anywhere else. So. I think uh, we're keeping pace, and I think uh, as technology becomes more ubiquitous to everybody, uh, you know, we're all, I think the, the globe is shrinking, and we're all kind of on one planet doing the same thing. You guys are essentially optimists. I get it. Mm. <laughs> I'm a sales guy. Sales guys <laughs> are well, optimists. I don't know about <laughs> analysts, but. Thank you, Dale. Well, thank you, Michael. Yeah, so it's been Thanks great for